So yeah, so my name is Steve McGill. I come uh, from Philadelphia. Uh, so I came on uh, the Bolt bus this morning to uh, talk to you guys about um, a little bit different side of artificial intelligence. So what I want to discuss is um, how people in the robotics community are looking at uh, solving some of the healthcare issues that we have. And uh, it's going to be from a slightly different angle than you guys are going to be expecting. So um, right now, many people are familiar with the Da Vinci surgical robot. Um, this is a very incredible machine. What it does is it hooks up these um, very minute little mechanical devices to a computer screen so that a, a doctor can actually perform minimally invasive surgery from a distance. They can be in a computer screen with little joysticks. They can do this right on site, or they can actually do it remotely, like a tele-operated uh, surgery. The difference here between uh, this surgery and uh, real um, robotics that we like to think of is the degree of aut autonomy. Okay, so uh, the surgical robot is not making any decisions. There's no feedback in here where the robot's guiding the surgeon. Um, this, the human is always making the decisions. Um, now, I don't think too many people here are ready for uh, a robot to play operation uh, with your body, but uh, what I want to talk about is putting autonomy into some different types of healthcare applications. Um, places where we're going to want to see robots giving care in the home, in the hospital, and different ways that we can improve um, patient interaction uh, with robots so that people can, can get better. Uh, and the way we're going to do this is a surprising way. It's going to be through robotic soccer. So uh, let me try to convince you that uh, robotic soccer is actually uh, a pertinent way of looking at this problem. Uh, Earlier this year, IBM released a computer called Watson that was able to compete on the show Jeopardy. And it was um, a marvel of artificial intelligence. It was able to beat the humans pretty easily uh, in this game. And it really showed how far the AI community has come over the years. But there was, a, there was a catch. In the same way that the surgery robot wasn't a full robot, IBM's Watson wasn't a full robot. It didn't move. That server rack uh, is pretty heavy. I don't think it has any legs. So it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, and it didn't have any cameras or uh, microphones so that it could sense the world. It just uh, sat there, took in digital questions, and gave out digital answers. Or in Jeopardy, took in digital answers and gave out digital questions. Um, and so what we want to do is put this, in this AI into a real world scenario. And uh, soccer turns out to be a really uh, a, a good pertinent situation. Because you need to be able to react in the world. You need to be able to find a moving ball uh, in the environment. You need to find your players, avoid the opponents. You need to be able to move around the environment, perform special actions like kicks and bicycle kicks. And um, you need to have a lot of AI to be able to um, pass for, uh, to uh, different robots and, and all kinds of different things that uh, we want to see these robots do. And so I'm going to introduce uh, what's called RoboCup. RoboCup uh, is an international soccer competition where we're trying to solve a lot of these artificial intelligence goals where robots can interact in the world. It was started in 1997 with the goal that by 2050, these robots are going to be able to beat the World Cup soccer team of humans. So uh, we're, we're on the path there. We're, we're getting there. So I'm going to show you uh, some of the steps on the evolution here. First, there were wheeled robots. And let's see if uh, this guy is going to load. And uh, these robots were all about um, having AI with a very simple hardware. They could uh, pass, shoot, and score. Um, but they were given all their information to them um, from those little markers, right? They knew all their positions. They just had wheels. There's nothing terribly remarkable there. If you had one of these robots in your house, you'd be like a Roomba. It couldn't go upstairs and vacuum the rest of it. Uh, so what we have next um, in evolution are the, uh, our man's best friend. Uh, and these dogs actually had to figure out where they were in the environment all by their lonesome. They had to look at, uh, look at the post. They had to look at the, uh, the, the goalie and figure out the best place to shoot. But they still were able to, uh, they, they were able to do some smart things, but they still weren't able to, say, open a door or something uh, relevant that we'd want a, a, a robot to do. So along comes uh, humanoids. And uh, I'm going to give you uh, a little idea of how far we've come. So, um, our partner lab at Virginia Tech has been working on these Darwin robots for, for a few years now. And they started out as uh, something that, uh, that a kid, a child would be, very uh, cautious, walking up to the ball, lining up for the kick, to something a little bit more dynamic, where it can really um, you know, sink into that ball and give it a good kick. Um, and so we perform in uh, this RoboCup competition for humanoids. And uh, last year, we took fourth place. And we lost to the Germans. We lost to the Japanese. And it wasn't that great. America's number one. So 
what we decided to do was have uh, a new uh, latest and greatest edition of this robot. We have all new motors, all new sensors, all new computers. Um, and so this is the Darwin OP, and they were ready to do battle in Istanbul this year. So I'm going to give you a little demo of these robots um, and see what you think of them as they're uh, trying to kick the robot here. So you have them trying to find the ball. They line up to it, and they give it a good kick. <laughs> they can chase the ball around stage, and you'll see the eyes turn green as it sees the ball. It'll get confused sometimes and look for it. It'll find it again, and it shouldn't go straight up in front of the stage. We don't want them walking too far. And you can uh, go give it a kick again. So these, uh, these guys are a little smart, too, right, when the ball moves around. Sometimes they fall down. They can get right back up again, OK? So these guys are some smart little critters. Um, and uh, this is Scarface here. He was one of our, uh, not one of our top scorers. Uh, he he um, put, <laughs> pushed down the most robots, so uh, <laughs> he was one of our favorites. And uh, what I'm going to do now is actually show you a video of, uh, of our competition here um, and see what you guys think of uh, some of these robots playing soccer and if you think we can reach that one. So here's, uh, I think this is Betty, she's lining up for a kick. Uh, Japanese goalie is pretty smart, but he's not quick enough not uh, agile enough for our robot. We uh, had some smarts and able to figure out the best way to get to the ball, and we get pretty excited. So, so the humans are getting pretty excited here as we're scoring one of these goals. But uh, I have to tell you, we got really excited this year because um, we won the championship, okay? <laughs> so, yeah, clap it up. So this was a lot of fun. Um, you know, we won this soccer competition. Um, but we want to bring it back to the actual technology that's involved. It's not all about soccer and kicking balls into nets, OK? It's all about the AI and being able to you know, parse your world um, into uh, intelligent objects that a robot can recognize. So let's start with the robot itself. This is a, it's still a piece of hardware, as cute as it may be. Uh, it's comprised of a camera, a computer, and a motor. So we're going to start, um, and start by the camera, with the camera and uh, take a look at each of these components one by one. So the camera guides the vision system, OK? And uh, you and I see a picture in the world, and we recognize the objects immediately. We can see a robot, a post, uh, a ball, and, uh, and the grass. The robot, I'm sure most of you know, just sees a bunch of numbers, OK? Um, and these numbers just correspond to the colors in the world. They don't have any idea um, what an object is. They just know that there's an orange pixel next to a red pixel. And orange could be any sort of number set. So what we want to do is be able to train these robots to figure out um, which numbers are important, how they can be grouped together, um, and what's a ball. So here's a little video of a, of a robot tracking uh, one of these balls. Um, and what it does is it segments every single pixel um, into uh, something meaningful like the ground, the ball, and the post. So it does this on color. So you'll notice the orange pixels are mapped to red in there. The black ones are mapped to green, meaning the grass. And we have to teach these robots this, OK? So the robots do a little bit of learning, OK? We'll click on the pixels and say, this, these are red pixels, these are green pixels. But it then needs to learn a whole bunch of other uh, sets of colors that could also be um, similar to the ground. We don't want to click on every single pixel. So that's one of the, one of the steps that we're doing in the uh, artificial intelligence community, is trying to teach robots um, what, these things me what these colors mean um, and how to be able to interpret the world into objects. But it's one thing to be able to interpret these things. It's another to be able to do something useful. So I'm going to show a bird's eye view, well, not a bird's eye view, a first person view of one of these robots chasing a ball. So it'll find the ball in the frame. It'll chase it. It wants to go kick it. But it needs to make sure it's kicking towards the right goal. So it looks up, finds the post, and gives it a good whack, OK? Um, so this is uh, really a good insight into how the robot's making a decision. And on the bottom right here, um, it shows where the robot thinks it is in the world, OK? That's called localization. You want to make sure that if you have a robot in a hospital or a home and you tell it to go to the garage, that it's not out, uh, out of doors and uh, doing something with the, with the neighbor's dog. So um, it needs to be able to localize well. And so we have different algorithms that are able to accomplish this. Um, but a bigger part is that we can't always use these resources um, where we put the robots out 
uh, all the time, set them up, tell them, go to the ball, and they miss it, and they miss it, and they miss it, and they miss it, or go to the net, and they miss it, and they miss it, and they miss it. We want to do something w which is called like rapid prototyping. We want to do things quickly. So what we do is we um, try these things in simulation first, where we have a robot that's exactly like our Darwin OP, where it goes, tracks the ball, gives it a good old kick, and then goes and tracks over it again. And what we can do here is run trials millions of millions of times until it gets things right, OK? Um, and so it'll go kick the ball. And here, it's not kicking towards the net. So the localization was bad, so we had to fix that. And if it's being bad, we uh, throw the robot up into the air and uh, have him fall down. So the robot also can learn some different motions in this world uh, without actually having to break a real robot. If I were to throw Scarface up and down and up and down, he might break. Um, but if I do it in simulation, it'll never break, OK? And so that's an important uh, part of testing some of our artificial intelligence. Another key component in humanoids is going to be their motor system, their locomotion. And sometimes this locomotion goes bad. And I'm going to show you a clip of something that happened in our RoboCup. Our robots got to the ball, and they fell over. And that was not good, because uh, they scored a goal. So what we want to do is make sure that our robots are intelligent, not just in their vision, but also in their locomotion. Okay? A lot of people do what's called keyframing, and they keyframe motion so that the robot puts one foot in front of the other. The problem is that the robot can't react to different surfaces. Okay? If it's trying to go up stairs or if it's walking over an uneven carpet, it's not going to be able to react properly to changes in, say, the step height or something that's, uh, that's awry on the ground, like uh, somebody left something on the floor. And so what we want to do is be able to teach these robots uh, how to avoid these things. And, um, what we do is we take some of the most misbehaving robots, and then we put them into our lab, and we uh, push them until they finally learn what to do. So what we do here is we poke the robot over and over and over again. It's very cathartic for a lot of us researchers. <laughs> so what these robots are actually doing is learning over many trials how best to avoid falling down. And they do this with a few different strategies. One is with their ankle, one is with their hip, and one is a step strategy. And all this is very important, um, but you need to be able to put these three things together. So what we do is we use some algorithms to figure out the best way to combine all these three strategies um, so that the robot will never fall down. Now, uh, we're a far cry from having robots that never fall down, but a lot of these active balancing strategies have really been able to help our robot locomote in different worlds. Uh, another thing that I want to talk to you guys about is moving these robots forward. It's one thing for us to play soccer, but where are the real applications? So one step forward in that direction is to make one of these robots more like a humanoid. And what do you think this robot is lacking? It's going to be lacking some hands, right? So what we've done is we've added some hands to our robot so that the robot can go and pick up its uh, favorite object in the world, a red ball. So it could go and pick, it, pick up this ball and walk with it without having to worry about the extra weight that it's carried and then go and give it a good old throw. So these are some of the important ways in which we're starting to adapt our framework. And we've, uh, we've even gone one step further, right? We've given these robots hands. They can uh, pass to each other. They can score goals. But what we've uh, found is a lot of times um, these robots are still pretty, pretty dumb in the world, and they'll fall down, and sometimes they can't get up. And uh, so what we need is a robotic healthcare solution, OK? So this is coming at it from the other end. When a robot breaks, how do we fix it? So what we've done is we've developed a, uh, a, a paramedic system where uh, some of these robots can actually pick up a stretcher um, and move it around. Now, I think you guys would definitely want to have uh, Scarface and Betty carrying you, you guys around uh, <laughs> in one of these stretchers. But uh, we're not quite there yet. There's still some uh, bugs to be ironed out. And uh, this, this is what happens when, uh, when they don't work. Uh, so. I think, uh, I think a lot of people in the robotics community are very excited with some of the progress that we've had. Okay? We're actually beginning to scale some of these robots up. We've solved a lot of the problems on these small scale robots. And what, we, what we've done is actually moved to larger robots, four feet tall, five feet tall. And we're starting to implement some of these same algorithms. So that you'll be able to see these robots larger being able to help people um, you know, move them around or interact with them in an environment. So I want to thank you for your attention and uh, hope you enjoyed the talk.